G'day and welcome to the Andrew Price Podcast, the podcast for serious artists. Normally, I am interviewing a guest, but as you can see, it is just me on this podcast where uh, I decided to do something a little different. I did a live podcast, mm, a live podcast on Blender Guru where I asked people to send me their questions into the live chat and then I answered it. So that is what this podcast is going to be. You're going to be hearing me reading and answering questions in real time uh, without knowing what they're going to be. So we talk about all sorts of things. We talk about AI, um, of course, a lot of questions on AI. We talk about NFTs. We have my thoughts on NFTs changed somewhat at all. We talk about the metaverse. We talk about learning how to, uh, if you're feeling demotivated, what you can do differently. Um, I will say, unfortunately, this <laughs> this video, there will be no video for this. Um, I actually had a video for the live stream, but I forgot to hit record on the OBS thing. So the, audio, the compression that YouTube did, there's no point reusing it. So it's just gonna be a title card for this, uh, this video. Um, so there'll be no video. It's just a talking head anyway. You don't need to see my head talk. So this will be a listening podcast for you to listen to the advice that was in it. Um, uh, yeah. Oh, also, by the way, there might not be another podcast for another month. And that is because I'm about to go to uh, America and then Amsterdam. So I'm going to be away from my studio. So I won't be able to record another podcast until I get back. Um, so, yeah. By the way, if you're going to be there, Lightbox Expo or the Blender Conference, I will see you guys there. Um, but yeah, without further ado, here is the live podcast without video. So we have 312 concurrent viewers and they are spamming the chat they're spamming the chat with um, a bunch of rambling nonsense right now no, no. <laughs> never a good idea to start a podcast by insulting your audience but uh but no at every stream there is a, a a certain percentage of nonsense and we got to prepare for that guys so this i'm going to open up to the chat now and people are going to send me questions and hopefully it doesn't go to crap. That's the plan. Um, <laughs> so guys, uh, please send in your questions right now and I will try to answer it. Um, try to pick an interesting question, something that I can talk about for a little bit and I will choose, uh, choose something fun. Okay. Okay. Here's a question. I can't seem to get comfortable with modeling. It's keeping me from getting deeper into 3D and it is very hard for me to grasp any idea on how to overcome this. Yeah, so learning anything has a certain degree of, you know, you're going to go through this chasm where you're just not able to really do anything um, by yourself and it can be very frustrating. And I would say when you're beginning trying to do anything by yourself, you will, you will fail and you just hit brick walls. That's where you need a mentor, a teacher, somebody to lead you through that. And the cheapest form of a teacher is tutorials. So if you are finding that when you're modeling, you just can't, you know, you forget what the tools are. You don't know how to do the thing that goes around it because it seems complex. You don't even know where to begin. You should be watching more tutorials. It's a sign that you haven't, you haven't got the foundations. We haven't, basically learned enough of the little skills and lessons and techniques um, by following enough tutorials yet. I, I remember very early on um, in my early Blender career, I was trying to do a lot by myself. Um, I watched a few tutorials, like I watched the Gingerbread Man tutorial, which by the way, fun fact, that used to be the, uh, the what do you call it? the blender tutorial that you started with if you were learning blender before the donut there was the gingerbread man and it was actually by the guy who uh who made blender nation uh bart bart veldheisen in amsterdam um but yeah i you know i followed those and then i was trying to make a scene myself i was trying to make like a cave or a car i really wanted to make a car and i just couldn't and it was because i just didn't have enough of the foundational knowledge yet now you could bumble your way through yourself, trying to like just brute force it, try every little tool and figure it out. But that's just silly. Like with the internet at your fingertips now, you can learn tutorials um, and that's what you need. So just more tutorials, more tutorials. And my cadence, the way I would recommend it is when you're starting out, do one tutorial and then try to do one similar result, similar teaching to the tutorial. Like, okay, you follow the donut, try to make now a muffin or a cupcake or something like that by yourself, okay, without any assistance. Then watch another tutorial. Then 
do something else by yourself that's similar to that one. Maybe you watch a tutorial on how to make a, a, a kitchen, right? Now try to make a living room, right? Something like that. Because if you're only following the tutorial, it can lead to a bit of false confidence where you feel like, ha, I got this, I can do anything. And then you end up hitting a brick wall and then you get demotivated. Um, but when you force yourself to try to um, do something else, that's when you start learning like, yeah, I don't really, I don't really have this in the bag yet, but it, it helps solidify that learning when you try to do it yourself. All right, long answer to that, but let's go on to the next questions. How do you deal with demotivation? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one, man. Um, I've, I've answered this, I guess, in a few older podcast episodes, but I don't blame you if you haven't seen it because there's a lot of, a lot of episodes or a lot of uh, questions in each episode. Um, but basically my approach to it, I mean, for one, it could be many things. Um, it, it could be life right? Maybe it could be things external to art. Maybe you're in a crappy job. Maybe your parents don't, you know, believe that you're going anywhere in life. All that stuff is, you know, it can impact your sleep. It can make you depressed. It could be something else under the surface. So I'm going to assume that it's not that and that the rest of your life is going fine, but you're just not motivated to learn Blender. Something that has always helped me is to bring it back to its roots and find out just revisit what it is that made you passionate about art in the first place. Um, what is it that you want to create? So pull up ArtStation and start pulling together a board, which you could use Pure Ref for, you could use Pinterest, of things that are your your goals, um, your idea, like your wannabe, right? As my wife calls it. Um, that's what you want to create. Start forming that and that'll help rekindle some of the fire that got you into it. Um, and then as for the demotivation, that again, if you're, you know, assuming you've got this inspiration, you probably can't just rush into one of those things that you want to create because you might not have the skill sets there. That's also where tutorials come into play. Um, now, if you've exhausted all the tutorials, maybe you're not a beginner, maybe you've been doing it for a while, but you're now just feeling crushing, defeated, you're not really going anywhere, you could try a mentorship. Um, so there is a website called Mentor Coalition, uh, but there are a number, basically a lot of professional artists are now using the power of the interwebs um, to do um, private tutoring, basically. And honestly, it's not that expensive. Uh, there was like a bit of a Twitter thread where somebody was calling out people who mentor that they were charging money for it and saying that it was like gatekeeping for the industry and it got like thousands of likes but that's twitter um <laughs> it also got thousands of people saying like this guy is just doesn't know what he's talking about um but there's not anyways point is is it's not that expensive and if you're really serious about art that might be something you want to consider or you could consider joining a free group in your local community. If you go to Meetup or you go to Facebook, there's probably some sort of group uh, for 3D, Blender, um, you know, Unreal Engine, whatever it is, just meeting people face to face and sort of presenting them with some of the problems that you've got, um, that can help. But also sometimes seeing people just go at it. And like, I remember, because um, I run this, or I, I ran, I haven't had another meetup in a few months since COVID, but um, this Blender meetup in Brisbane, and there was this girl and she was just like passionate. She was like this, she was like 14 or something. And she was just making stuff. Like she just woke up one morning and she wanted to make a pirate ship. So she made a pirate ship and then she make up and then she made an island. And, and it was just like, wow, when you just like go for it, you can really like build these these worlds and like you don't have to necessarily have a plan. You don't have to like overthink things. You can just like jump into it. That in itself can be inspiring. So that's uh, my suggestions. Okay, here we go. We got an AI question, guys. All right, inevitable. What is the role of an artist with all those AI systems being developed now? What should we focus on learning now? What skills are the most important now? Skill sets haven't, okay, they have changed a little bit. All right. Um, what you should focus on is the same as what you should have been focusing on before. I mean, <laughs> I'm going backtrack. Okay, let me answer that again. Um, <laughs> okay, so AI is, I think, very good at doing technical things, technical skills. And this is part of the reason I think that people, 
I mean, I haven't haven't said this before, but like a lot of the outrage of like, it's too good. Like, how is it able to do, you know, the work of a, a professional artist? How is it able to do that for nothing? It, it's, I kind of feel like saying like, maybe that's because we haven't been making art, <laughs> you know? It's, if a computer can do it, it might not be art. I don't, okay, that ends into a whole philosophical debate. But I think what we have been doing up until now is a lot of technical skills. So in talking about like um, even like 2D drawing, right? There's a whole skill set in like rendering, we, which is not to be confused with 3D rendering, but rendering a 2D thing means taking a sketch, filling it with color, then shading in the areas that are occluded, then doing a shadow pass, then doing the, the light. That is called a rendering in, in 2D. That is something that AI can do very, very well. And really there's not, once you've got the foundational knowledge of how to render in 2D, how to do the layers in Photoshop, all that kind of thing, it can really be taught to anyone. And I know that sounds controversial to say, but you can see it. Like they are farming it out to, you know, people in China. There, There's a lot of people on, on Fiverr that have just followed tutorials in Photoshop and they're able to like do it. And yes, there will be uh, circumstances where they just completely wrong, they completely confuse it. And there's a whole bunch of, I'm not like, you know, saying that there's no skill involved, but that is a technical skill. So there's, I, I consider the art, artist skill sets, there's three buckets, right? You've got your technical, okay? And that's things that you have to learn um, in order to, uh, to, to do anything. So in Blender, it's like learning what the buttons do, how to get any sort of result, basically how it works, that kind of thing. Um, for, for 2D, it might be like drawing straight lines, drawing a uh, pencil, um, how to shade, you know, those sort of like things that you could put in a textbook almost is the technical. Then you've got the aesthetics, okay? And that's the, um, what I would say, like the design fundamentals of theory of composition, color, light, um, all that stuff is the aesthetics. Making something, okay, like, yes, you can make something look photo real if you only did technical skills, okay? But aesthetics is, can you make something look good? actually pleasing, good design, all that stuff is the aesthetic stuff. Uh, and then finally, the third bucket is what I would call the creative, okay? And this means thinking outside the box of ideas that haven't been thought of. It's, um, you know, writing music, uh, that infusing two types of music that haven't gone well together and somehow making it work. Um, it's, uh, there's been so many examples, I just can't think of them right now. Um, it's, it, it's basically, it's the vision, I guess you'd call it, the director of a movie, uh, or the, I guess maybe like the, the screenwriter, the, the, the writer, the, someone who's got this wild idea and, and the way that it's, the way that that idea is formed. Um, there's a great book, Creativity Inc. Um, by Ed Catmull. Funny fact, fun fact, uh, Catmull, that's where you, you might recognize the name in Subsurf Modifier, right? Catmull, that's because Ed Catmull of Pixar came up with that method. Um, great book, and he explains that basically every movie of Pixar's was um, a terrible idea at the start, and it's actually getting it to the point that it's actually good. That's all. Um, that's that's their method, basically. So I, I see those three buckets: the technical, the aesthetics, and the creative. Those skill sets. I think the technical skill sets are becoming less required, um, but that hasn't that. I wouldn't say that's necessarily a new thing. Like when, uh, I would say maybe five, 10 years ago, when artists started to, you know, um, when remote work became possible through the internet, like latency and distribution of the internet around the world, going into um, cheaper regions, basically, where you could hire a workforce than, for cheaper than you could in anywhere else, perhaps. Um, you could suddenly see that like, wow, like, yeah, you can hire somebody to do like an illustration for like $2 an hour, right? And it was because it was, it was a technical skill set. They only needed to watch a few tutorials, read a few articles or, um, or, or posts on how to do things, how to use the, um, you know, the, the pen tool in Illustrator and things like that. Um, that was all they needed. And then they could do technically they could do the thing. They could take a sketch given by a client and they could fill it in in Illustrator to create a vector drawing. It's only technical skills that's required. And I think that that is what AI is good at right now. Now, the aesthetics is debatable. 
whether an AI can can learn that because it is hit and miss. I don't necessarily think it knows when it's got a good result or not. When it's got a good design, when it's got a good composition, it it can get there accidentally. I just don't know if it's uh, very good necessarily. It, it, it's great at exploring ideas. And, and we actually have talked about AI for maybe the last like five podcast episodes. We've had concept artists on, um, art directors on to talk about their thoughts on AI. So if you want to actually learn I don't know, other, other perspectives on it, I recommend listening to the podcast. Um, but something interesting about AI is that the, the people who would tend to get the best out of AI tend to be good artists because they know when they're looking at the results that this is not, it, it's not enough. Whereas somebody else previously would look at something and they go like, wow, that's cool. I, don't, I wouldn't know how to do that. And then they go, that's great. So they stop after like two prompts because they're like, this is amazing. I, I'm doing stuff that like professional artists did. But a professional artist sees that result and goes like, we're just getting started, right? Because the other thing you have to do with, when you're doing these prompts is you have, to, uh, you have to direct it, right? You have to look at the result and go, it's not right for these reasons. The computer does not know what you want. You have to tell it what you want. So it is really, I think the best way to think of AI is like, what if you gave everyone in the world $100,000 that they could spend on how many of our artists they want on Fiverr? That's kind of what AI is doing. It has just drastically reduced the cost of doing the technical skills that, um, yeah, like, you know, a lot of uh, technical artists are doing on Fiverr. Not to say, by the way, that there's anything wrong with doing technical skills. That is a job skill set. And, uh, you know, yes, just like rotoscoping, anything else, um, it is, there is a risk that you will be made redundant one day when technology catches up. Because if that's all you know, technology will conquer it one day. So I think that it's accidentally getting some good compositions, it's accidentally getting some good designs. And it's up to the artist to recognize it and know when to push it. Um, and then the creative aspect, knowing how to infuse ideas together that don't go together, um, tell a different story, tell something from a different perspective, all that stuff is also, I would say that that's like way outside the realm of AI, personally. Again, it, it, you can kind of, it can do it accidentally. So it's not to say that you don't get a result from AI that is not creative because it's certainly, you can get that result, but it's up to the artist, your skill, is to have that vision and know how to guide it. So I actually think that being an AI artist or learning AI skill sets will be a requirement in the coming five years. I would imagine that studios will not want to hire people who do not know how to use a lot of these art generators because it will speed up workflows for some things. And if you don't know what those things are, then you might be doing something an old fashioned way, a traditional way, where then the boss comes back and goes like, why is this taking so long? And they're like, well, this is how it's always done. It always takes, you know, I always create a material and substance designer and then I do it like this. And they're going, you don't know that AI does this in a few clicks, you know? Um, you do need to know these tools. And then also you need to know how to get the most out of those tools. So yes, that will be, um, that will be important. Anyways, hope that answered your question. Um, yeah, now I'll read more questions. I think the individual creating models, meaning everyone creates their own model over and over again, is so insanely inefficient. I know there are markets, but seriously, who's got all that money and time? Yeah, this is um, what you learn is the difference between the professional and the beginner mindset is that everything is a question of time and money. Um, a professional knows how to model a chair. It's easy, right? But it takes time to model that chair takes time, it might take them an hour or two. And they know that their hourly rate that they're billing the client or that they're working for their boss for is 40 or 50 bucks an hour. And they're able to buy it for 10, 15 bucks online. So it's a no brainer to buy something when you already, when it is more expensive for you to create it from scratch. Whereas beginners, they think that that's cheating. Nothing could be further than the truth. How do you plan your tutorials, especially your multi-part intro series? Yeah, tutorials is an interesting one. Um, the guys that work with me will tell you that it is frustrating because they never know how a tutorial is going to finish up because if it is, we might start something, go like, all right, we're going to do a tutorial on, um, I don't know, like texturing, right? The ground, right? And then in order to do that texturing, like ground texturing, we sort of realize that like, oh, that's kind of an interesting process, but it's like part of a skill set 
that is like texturing. It's like texture painting. So maybe it's better as a texture painting course. Or maybe the scene that itself that we're making, that's a more interesting prospect. And so therefore maybe it would be better as like a shortened, like my, like my abandoned house tutorial or these shorter ones that I've been doing lately where it's sort of like live, but it's like chopped up. So it really depends on the way we do it. And once we start learning it, we, we figure out what is the best method essentially. But we don't know when we go into it, how we're going to do it. Okay. Why do you prefer Blender over other softwares such as Maya or Houdini, which are considered the industry standard? Oh, kick in the hornet's nest. Oh, rip him to shreds, guys. Take him down in the comments. No, um, very good question. It is true. Uh, the industry standard is Maya or Houdini for certain things. Why to prefer Blender? It depends what it is you want to do. If you want to work for a studio, then you have to learn Maya. Right. If you want to work in animation in BFX, you have to learn Maya. Sorry, that's just how it is because you're entering into their pipeline, which is very expensive to change. They cannot change it for you. And knowing even a little bit of Maya before you try to get a job somewhere will be helpful. Why do I use Blender though? Because that's what I, that's all I'm using it for. I mean, my use is obviously very different. I've got a whole business around Blender, so I can't just very easily pick up Maya and use it. Um, but if I was a freelancer by myself and I was just making artwork for clients, I would use Blender because it is free and it does most of the things that the other softwares do. So when you're working by yourself, you have carte blanche to choose which software you want to use and for what. When you start you working with other people and those other people's softwares are conflicting, you have to come to a standard, right? We're doing it right now with Polygon. We're hiring a bunch of modelers uh, or soon hiring a bunch of modelers and we need to figure out, you know, what sort of standards, how our formats going to be, how, wh what model formats are we saving into? What softwares are we authoring that content into because then it has to go from this software into substance painter because the final part of the texturing process is done in substance painter so you know it all has to be considered so it's i mean it's probably it's been said many many times before but it's not that Maya or Houdini is necessarily better for VFX or animation. It can be at certain things. And for sure, Houdini is better at simulations than I think all of them. Um, certainly Blender's. Blender's simulations is very, very weak. I'm hoping they improve that with particle nodes and other simulation nodes coming later. It's just taking forever and I'm so tired. But um, <laughs> it, it, it's not that they're necessarily better. It's sometimes just that it's become an established workflow right? There are, there are plugins, there are workflows that like a, a place like ILM cannot very easily shift to something else when they've got, uh, you know, plugins, pipelines, they've got support or, or, you know, whatever it is that they've, um, that they've already set up over the decades that they've been using it, internal tools that they've built scripts, all that kind of thing. If you came into ILM and then went, guys, why don't we use Blender? They would probably finally think, they go, okay, we won't, it's not a fireable offense to suggest that, but it's very concerning that you would think that that would be an option. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it's it's not anything to do with the quality of it, of the software, that it is an industry standard. It could be just many other things. Um, but I have also heard that Blender is lacking many features that would... Um, that are necessary in order for it to be part of like a VFX pipeline. I don't know enough to actually speak on those things, um, but I'm sure others will. Um, we got another paid question. How do you manage your time between running pod, sorry, running Polygon, the channel, the podcast, learning stu new stuff and the social home life? It's always a balancing act and sometimes you fall off the edge. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, it, I have to use my time where it's best spent, like where it's most valuable. Um, now, podcasting is not actually that valuable. Like there's not that many viewers that the podcast gets. Um, it is a, a small segment. I'd say like one in 10 artists that watch tutorials uh, watch podcasts, I'd say. Um, but it's useful for me for other things. One, it's quite easy to create. I just turned on the, the lamp and I hit stream and now I'm doing a podcast. It's not, doesn't require months of planning like some tutorials do. But also in my specific case, I've changed it to so that I get something valuable out of it. So I've been interviewing guests lately. So that has been worth it to me for networking, 
contacts and just being able to pick the brains of, of experts. So I sort of get a kick out of that. So that's why I do that. Um, but yeah, like running running the business versus running YouTube, it's, it's honestly a toss up. There are some times where I have to step away from the YouTube channel for like a few, a couple of months I think I've done in the past um, just to focus on Polygon because there's so much there that requires my attention. And then likewise, there's sometimes where I have to step away from Polygon for a week, usually not more than a week to try to do a video. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, you've only got so many hours in a day. It's not infinite. So you have to use your time valuably. Okay, I should do a, a normal question. So it doesn't look like I'm like only picking these people who do paid ones. Your new thoughts on NFTs, <laughs> the controversial NFTs question. Um, yeah, I mean, I totally get why people um, don't like NFTs um, for all the reasons that you hate NFTs. I can assure you, like I probably do as well. Um, mostly it's just the community is just seems much like whenever there's a gold rush or there's like any get rich quick scheme, you hop into a room of people that have that mindset of getting rich quick and you just want to leave as soon as possible. It's just, it's selfish and it's uh, it's like narcissistic. It's, you want to like looking for opportunities to get one over on other people. There's all of that in the NFT and crypto space. And uh, I just hate it. I really hate it. Um, so there are there are plenty of reasons. I mean, the security stuff, the usability of a lot of these Web3 sites. You know, I'm using Foundation for my NFTs and it's like, it's so glitchy. Like you click the thing to mint it and it's like, it doesn't work. Where's the pop-up, the thing? It's like, I got to figure out how to get a token. What does that mean? What, what are these strings of digits? It's very unusable. There's all sorts of security concerns. You worry that if somebody ever got your password, it's over. There's no recovery. There's no bank you can call to get your funds back. There's so many reasons to hate it. Um, so I think people are right that it's not ready for prime yet. It's not ready to go mainstream yet, right? Um, but I think it will. And the reason I think it will is that every new technology faced that growing pain period. Um, when the internet first was invented and started to become public and people started talking about it. Um, you can actually look at like old clips from like talk shows where they're asking like really basic questions and kind of like laughing at the answers like, oh, this thing's never gonna take off. What is this stupid idea? Uh, like there's a famous one with Bill Gates um, on the David Letterman show. He's talking about how, you know, you could, you know, you could use the internet to look up what the scores were for the latest baseball game. And then David Letterman's like, you ever heard of the radio? And, you know, the whole audience laughs. Um, and at, at the time, uh, people were saying that the Internet was going to take over commerce. We were going to go away from retail. And one day we'd be able to buy plane tickets over the Internet. And people thought it was ridiculous. It would never happen. And they had every right to think that because at the time, the infrastructure was woeful credit card infrastructure it was just like it was so risky to type your credit cards into a website because it didn't have all those protocols none of that stuff was set up yet so um they were very right to to assume it they're also like web servers uh, you might not know this if you're a young person today but websites going down used to just be a regular thing there used to be some websites where um, it would just go up and down constantly. They just couldn't get a hold of their servers. They didn't have S3 like we do now. We don't have cloud storage. We don't have like elasticity to our usage so that as more people start to access something, it adds more service to it. All that infrastructure was just not set up. It was also very costly. Um, the energy efficiency of servers has dramatically dropped to the, um, there's actually like a crazy chart that shows like um, the cost of like, storing uh, a gigabyte or whatever over the years um, in a, an online server. And it's, it's just a fraction of both storing and serving that content now. So NFTs is, is over here. It's at that early beginner stage. And so everything that people are saying about NFTs, I think is true. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's scammy. It's got all these issues. Yes, 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 yes. But I think fundamentally it is an exciting piece of technology. Because I think everybody agrees that the ad revenue model sucks. Everyone agrees. It sucks. You go across the internet, everyone's trying to shove adverts in there using pop-up blockers and it's trying to shove more in the other way and then they can't view it because you've got a blocker and you're just, you know. 
Um, we're all trying to do that because adverts are so annoying and they're tracking your, your movements. And we've got Google and we're streaming it on a Google service right now, but they've built a model around this, this tracking. So there's all sorts of privacy concerns there, but it's basically, it's, it's an annoyance tax, right? You want something for free, you've got to pay this annoyance tax. You can't get, you know, any news nowadays without, you know, 10 adverts playing on the page and it's just, it's an obnoxious experience. I, I really hope that we can eventually move away from adverts. And I, I think NFTs play a role in it, maybe. Um, the other way it might is just crypto in general. Um, I think the Brave browser has a similar, I think they've got their own crypto coin for this maybe. But this idea that if you could, much like YouTube Premium, if you could put $10 into your browser every month, let's say, and then you could visit all the websites you want to without adverts and just view it and have access to it. And then all the creators that, or the, the websites that you visited over that month get a fraction of the $10 that you sent. And if you visited a hundred, it's you know a fraction of this amount. And if you visited a thousand, then it fractions it this way. Um, I think that would be a fantastic model. It works well for YouTube Premium. The only reason it doesn't work for other websites is like every website currently needs to have their own subscription service in order for this to make sense. And it's too costly and you know they just churn through because you're only visiting the website every now and then. Um, I think crypto could get there because it could, um, I mean, for one, just the pains of online buying things, it's just, it's frustrating. Um, yeah, I, anyways, I, I, people say that um, crypto and NFTs are a, a solution in search of a problem. Don't think that's true. <laughs> I don't think that's true at all. Um, I think that it's ignoring the biggest problem that it's solving is that it's decentralized. The fact that now in today's world, you need, um, you need money for everything and you need to have an online presence for everything. And we're starting to realize the downsides of that is that when those people who own the thing don't like you for whatever reason, they can cut you out of it, right? And today that means sort of like being taken out of society, right? You're not able to, I mean, the scary, uh, I mean, I don't want to defend the guy, but I heard like Alex Jones was refused a visa card, right? Okay, yeah, I'm not defending him, okay, but, if, if that was to spread, let's say, okay, where the people at Visa were suddenly deciding who was able to have a Visa card, that you could imagine, and you could, most people could see why that would not be a great idea. Um, so that's where I think uh, crypto can help. But again, it's a, it's, it's a very horrible place at the moment. <laughs> it's not friendly and everyone has every reason to hate it, but I just hope that it gets there eventually because there's so many problems with the existing systems that we have. Okay, all right, long answer to that. Do you actually eat donuts? No, I actually don't. <laughs> I think I have, when I made the last donut tutorial, I wanted to get reference photos of it. I went to a donut shop for the first time in my life probably to buy a donut and um, I bought it. And then I was like, all right, well, I gotta eat this thing after I took the photos of it and I bit it and I'm like, whoa, this is so addictive. I can see why people eat these things. It was just like my brain was like, yes, more of that. That is amazing. Um, but yeah, no, it's just, I imagine just full of calories. It's like there's there's my daily calorie allotment down. Um, anyways. Okay. How to get, oh, hang on a second. It says, all right. I, th I said there was 4,000 viewers. No, no, sorry. It's a fraction of that that's concurrent. So it's 4,000 that have tuned in and tuned out. Okay, no, it's, four, it's 486 concurrent viewers. All right. Okay, let's get to a 3D question. Will you host a 3D challenge sometime in the future? You know, I'd love to, actually. Um, yeah, I, I, I would love to. It's just uh, planning those events can be time consuming. And also it's hard to figure out how to do it through the YouTube channel because most people find my content through YouTube. So I'd have to like make a video going like, hey guys, there's a challenge, do it. And that's not much of a video. I mean, I guess you can do like a post kind of thing. But anyways, there's a lot of effort that goes into it. I'd love to do it, I just haven't planned for it. But yes, I do want to do one. Can't find shortcuts PDF. Uh, it's free. If you, you're probably watching my old tutorial where I said you had to sign up for a newsletter. Watch my new one, the Blender, 3.0 um, version of the donut tutorial, it's in the description of that video. 
That's all you need to do. Click the link and there's the shortcuts PDF. You don't have to subscribe. Okay, if you owned Blender, what would you improve for it to be more easily adopted in industrial areas like architecture or animated film making? That depends on whether or not that is something that you want to do. Um, because if I own Blender, what would I improve for it is I might give a different answer to that than if I was trying to get it into certain industries. If you're trying to get it into certain industries, you just talk to people in those industries, find out what's stopping you from using Blender, and then you develop those features. Blender could do that, and actually it's it has done that famously in the past, and it's added a bunch of things. People have added things to the code because they work in those industries. Um, but as Ton has famously said, Blender is for people who use Blender. <laughs> they're not necessarily interested in transforming um, old industries into adopting Blender because that can come with disadvantages. Like maybe they require you to use some asinine file format that is just it's costly, it's got all these issues with it, and it requires you to have SDKs from Autodesk in order to open it or something like that. Well, that just might, maybe you just don't wanna do that, right? Which is a fair point. Maybe you just wanna go after creative people, wanna go after the single individual artists who just wanna be able to create. And I think that's more Blender's mission. So it's really just a matter of listening to the community. How do you feel about, oh, we got another AI question, guys. How do you feel about AI use for 2D art reference? Proco is pretty excited, could speed up skill development by a lot. Have a good day. I haven't seen Proco's thoughts on it. Um, 2D art reference sounds, um, yeah, I mean, for sure. Like if you're looking for reference for a character that you want to draw and you're looking for a warrior but all the photos you can find of warriors look a certain way and you want it to be a different way you want it to be crouching and like it's looking down on the warrior from above and you can't find any reference photos of that then for sure i could see how ai could be useful for that um, i just haven't experienced that myself yeah how much money should you charge for your 3d models clients um, I actually had some interesting advice from this. It was from a guy called Chris Doe, who is a well-known um, guy from the channel Future. He's got an Instagram account. He gives advice in these like little slides. But there was an interesting one that someone recommended, which was um, that he promoted. It said, you should try to aim for a 70% acceptance rate for your quotes. So if you're getting accepted, like, let's say you you're, when you're, you have 10 clients that approach you, right? And nine of them accept your quote, that probably means you're too cheap. If you're maybe only four or five of those people are accepting your quote, then maybe you're too expensive. So you should try to aim for a 70% um, rate. I generally, generally as a, as a rule, I think most freelancers are underpricing themselves. There is a great presentation with um, Ramit Sethi on the, what's the name of that guy? Uh, I'm gonna forget it. He was, uh, he's a photographer and it was a, an interview with him. What's the name of the guy I'm thinking of? He's a photographer. Is it Chris something? Something, and he, oh, Creative Live, that's the one. Yes, he created a company called Creative Live. I just don't know the name of his podcast now that I'm thinking of it. Chase Jarvis, thank you, all right. So Chase Jarvis, um, he had an interview with Ramit Sethi and they talked all about pricing for clients. Great interview, great series. If you're curious about that, he has great advice because um, Chase also was a photographer, did freelancing, talks about how he, how he worked for clients and underpricing, overpricing. And then Ramit Sethi is famously a, uh, a money guy. Um, talks all about like, value, understanding value, the prospect of the clients, and also how to price yourself. It's just a fantastic conversation. They can answer it far better than I would. So I'd recommend watching that. Pro tip for artists, learn how to use your time efficiently. If you are spending time making a shader that you've already built a hundred times before, that is time not spent somewhere else more important. Polygon solves this by giving you access to over 5,000 assets, which are plug and play. Shaders, models, and HDRIs that are created to a reliable, consistent standard so you don't have to waste any time fixing them. 
And with our new Blender add-on, you can search, download, and import assets directly into your scene from your sidebar, meaning you can keep your focus where it needs to be, which is making good art. You can try 100 assets for free by clicking the link in the description or by going to polygon, P-O-L-I-I-G-O-N.com and signing up for a free account. All right, I'm worried about investing time and committing to a career in 3D because I fear the industry will disappear. Do you think there will be work going forward 10, 20, 50 years in the future? I got very hard to predict 50 years in the future. I don't know about that. Um, 20 is even pretty difficult, but for sure 10. And I think even 20, I mean, if I, yeah, I'd probably say 20. It will be here. It will not be what it is today. That's the only stipulation. Um, AI, if you think AI is going to take your job right now, uh, I would reflect on that and see what value is it that you're actually doing. Because if it's really like somebody can type in a prompt and they can get something and it looks as good or better than yours, you need to add more skills to that. Um, you need to be telling better stories. It needs to be better than what the AI had, had done. I mean, look, I also, I, I don't, I also feel a little bit bad for some of the artists that have been doing, you know, like impressionist paintings or something like that. These like old fashioned things that they've been doing with digital paint. And now it can really just knock that out of the park, AI can. And because if it's something simple like a beach scene, right? The AI has just got like millions of reference of beaches and like how to interpret beaches and also impressionist painting. So it can combine the two. And if that was your skill set, if you just like lived off of impressionist paintings, you could see this as a threat, especially if most of your work came from freelance, from like, like people doing commissions. I can definitely understand that. Um, but there's a lot that AI can't do well, like at all, like it just fails. In fact, most of my experiences with AI have been, wow, this really sucks. Um, <laughs> uh, very, I'm, I've been blown away by a lot of what I've seen, but when I use it myself and I try to direct it some way, it's like, I just don't know what prompt I have to throw this thing for it to get anywhere near what I'm trying to do because everything I'm trying, it just keeps churning out crap. And then when I get something good, I'm like, all right, I'm getting there. And then I throw another prompt at it and it just goes in the other direction. And I'm like, oh, I can't be bothered, you know? Um, so I, I think that that is a skill set in and of itself, learning how to use AI. It is a skill set. There's a guy on our team at Polygon who knows AI back and front. He's installed all the different stable diffusions and random chaos and all these different open source ones. He's tried all the models. He's constantly trying to do different types of illustrations, feed it different things and push it further and further and further. That is a skill set that I highly value because not everyone knows how to do that. You have to feed it hundreds of prompts sometimes to get to these amazing pitches. That's why I think that argument um, when it made the, the news headlines like this artist uh, won an art competition using AI and everyone was like shitting all over him. I don't think people understand how many prompts it would take to get there. If he gave you his prompt, the finished prompt, yes, you could probably generate the image yourself and then easily tweak it yourself, but you wouldn't know how to get there unless they gave you the prompt. So getting those like amazing images that blow you away Sometimes I, I imagine it probably even takes longer to do it with AI through the prompt process than hiring a, somebody who's got the 2D skills who could do it the old fashioned way currently because it is, it's, it's, it's tedious. So that will become a skill set in and of itself. So as I've said, within five years, probably within two, if you don't know AI art in any way, you won't be able to get a job. Um, you, you might not have to use it all day, all part of your job, um, but you will have to know when you should use it. And then when you are using it, how to get the most out of it. I, I, I think artists will still definitely be needed. What are your thoughts on AI copying the style of a certain artist? Good question. Um, I think that it looks bad because it's a computer, but if it was a human, nobody would have any issue with it. And I also understand why people are mad that 
it's a computer that does it because it's doing it for free instantaneously without any technical skills. Whereas when a fan of an artist says, look, I was really inspired by your work and look, I made this painting in the style of what you've done. That artist is honored that somebody invested all their time in order to do that thing. Now, when you're seeing people type in, you know, such and such and such by Greg Rakowski and it's coming out with an image that looks like one of Greg Grakowski's um, paintings, I understand why it's making people angry. Um, but unfortunately, it's, it's not illegal. So far as I know, um, it is transformative. It is using publicly available information and it has interpreted it in a way to completely transform it that no definition of the law currently, as far as I know, I'm not a lawyer, don't quote me, um, will see that as copying um, or any sort of uh, copyrights infringed upon that. Um, we're sort of looking at it currently with like Polygon, like what sort of uh, IP is there with, with furniture, right? Can you just like make a couch by Minotti or is there infringement? And it depends on if it's a de registered design. If it's a registered design, it means you can't. But most furniture, it does not have a registered design. And the reason for that is that you have to prove that your furniture is unique. And most furniture is not unique because there's only so many ideas out there. So most ideas were copied from other people. So all the artists, the greatest artists today, uh, copied and learned from the artists that came before them and the artists that came before them and those artists that came before them. That's how it's always been. And AI has just come in and it's just done it you know, on crack. It's just scoured the internet through millions of images with these wide eyes, just taking everything in, soaking it in like a sponge. And now it is transforming art that it has seen into something else. And unfortunately, I don't think that you could ever, pr I mean, the law would have to change basically to say that there is a, a legal problem here. Um, as far as I know, again, not a lawyer, don't quote me. Um, but I understand why people are upset against it. I think it's just very early days and much like with any new thing, um, you're seeing the problems or you're seeing a lot of um, reaction to it. And in five years, we'll kind of laugh at it um, because I think that artist or the, you know, uh, the artist that had their work, you know, copied and they're a little bit annoyed about it, will be using AI themselves and they'll be realizing that they are able to output way better results than everyone else because they've got the foundational skills. Um, and then there's also like new AI, like this is just early days. Corridor put out a video last week about um, where they actually added to the training data of AI with images of their own faces and then reference themselves in drawings. That's crazy. So, I mean, if you can do that, I mean, I could create a series of artworks in a series of styles that are like quite unique. You can't find them on the internet perhaps put that into it and then say, keep copying that style that I've just created, but do it for this new thing. And then I could take that and then tweak that, feed that back into it and keep going. I mean, you could change, you could do so many different workflows that we just, we just don't know about. So I think it's very exciting there for sure. If you could, you should teach on Udemy. I'd love to support you more. I'm currently taking Udemy classes early this year and trying to avoid YouTube. Trying to avoid YouTube? Um, there's definitely uh, um, some value to you, like to courses, because that's one thing that YouTube kind of lacks is like good curriculums. Um, that's, yeah, I mean, for sure. When people put a price tag on something, it generally tends to be higher quality and they're able to put a lot more effort into it than a one-off YouTube tutorial. So I definitely think Udemy tutorials are great. Um, my my strategy is just different, really. I'm going for like mass market, trying to hit a wider audience. And the way, the reason I can do that without putting stuff on Udemy is that I've got Polygon. Polygon is what I reference and make my tutorials using. So therefore every tutorial I do, if enough percentage of people subscribe to Polygon after watching the video, I can keep making videos for free. And I can put in a lot of effort into those videos that I don't have to put behind a paywall on Udemy. That's a crazy business model I had to invent because the only other revenue was like ad revenue, right? Which is just silly on YouTube. <laughs> it's uh, in my NFT video, I explained you make half a cent per viewer, half a cent, cut a penny in half for every viewer that comes to it, which means you need a thousand viewers to afford a cup of coffee. One thousand people, a thousand people. That's more than the upcoming Blender conference, right? And that's what you need to get one cup of coffee. A thousand people, one cup of coffee. 
it's it's crazy that that's how it is today. Um, so you really need volume to really make any sort of uh, any sort of money uh, on, on today's platforms. Please use your influence to petition for modifiers being able to be put on collections. Array warp also add a fridge to Polygon. Thanks. <laughs> um, I haven't thought of that. Using putting modifiers on collections, huh? For sure, yeah. I mean, isn't collection nodes, that's something that is planned, right? Or is that just a segment of geometry nodes? But I imagine it'll come, it'll happen. Um, I don't know if I need to petition. <laughs> I don't want, I don't know if the Blender Foundation wants me like stirring a pot without like dipping my toes into it, but it's a good idea. And yes, we will have fridges coming to Polygon soon. Um, we're changing a bunch of things at Polygon. We're doing collection-based scoping now instead of categories. So we're able to do like entire rooms will start being uploaded to Polygon rather than like just concrete or something like that. Anyways, oh, here's a good question. Okay, why does it matter that the size is accurate when what you're making when you're making something in 3D? Um, it matters. It doesn't matter really if you're just making a model that you're going to like export to Unreal Engine or you know another piece of software because it's in a vacuum, it's in a 3D space. How big is the size of a grid? It's all relative, right? You, you're right, it doesn't actually matter. You will realize very quickly though that when you start using other assets that you've made, if you made a chair at this scale and then you made another like the fridge at a different scale and now the fridge is smaller than the chair now you got to scale up the fridge it just simplifies things when you've got the scale correct when you're just beginning the project that you get the scale right so that when you add other things to it you don't have to correct for it um, it also comes into play if you're going to be rendering so you might not think like, okay, I'm just making a fresh scene. I'm not gonna be importing anything. It doesn't matter. I can just do it at whatever scale I want. I used to think that. And then I started using it, the, the camera with the depth of field, right? Depth of field changes depending on scale. So if you haven't used the correct scale for your scene, you could have depth of field, which looks wrong. The scene could look really miniature. Like you could do a living room that looks miniature because the it's got so much depth of field. And you're like, why is it so like, everything's fuzzy? It's because it's the wrong scale. Um, so it matters for a lot of things. And so it is just easier that you model in the right scale. Hope that answers your question. Question, do you regret buying your two Titan GPUs at the time you did considering the market afterwards? No, cause I didn't buy them. <laughs> it was the first time that I'd ever been given something for free. Uh, NVIDIA gave them to me. That was super nice. And they didn't even require anything. They just had to say like, you know, if it makes, you know, if you're rendering something and you want to say what graphics card you're using, just say you're using the, the Titans. And I'm like, that's what I do already. And I'm like, all right, here you go. Um, I didn't get a 3090 until like way after they came out. I had to buy them myself. I just, <laughs> I was going to make a video on it, but I made it, uh, I bought a computer and the computer is worth $22,000. <laughs> it was the most I'd ever spent on a computer. It's got four 3090s in it. Um, and uh, I've had that for about six months. And now there's a 4090. So I'm like, mm -hmm. a little bit bummed. Um, but I, I mean, the reason I bought the whole, the big computer was like, um, oh, it's the Camino. I'm supposed to, I am actually supposed to call out what it is because they gave me a discount on the computer. I think they took off like six grand or something. It's the Camino Grando RM workstation. Um, and they're a company in Latvia. And however, somehow they had 3090s when nobody else did through COVID. And they had four of them. And I'm like, all right, well, I guess I got to buy your computer so I can get these, these cards. So I did. Anyways, opinion on Ian Hubert. He's great. <laughs> He's great. Love Ian Hubert stuff. His is stuff like, it's kind of the... Uh, in a way, it's almost like the polar opposite of my tutorials because his is the fast, dirty, cheat approach to doing it, which is the best way to do some things, especially if it's like a solo person project. If you're directing an animated short or something like that, and it's just you working on it, you know exactly where the shot's gonna be and what shortcuts you can make if you know them. So him doing these crazy shortcuts is, is great. My approach is I try to do it the slow, steady approach of like learning like 
the science of the shader and like what does this thing actually do? What does this setting do that people think that you just click it and it just works? Like, is it altering something else in the scene? Because my experience with Blender, like my early days was, in fact, you can even like in my old tutorials, I used to say like, I don't know what this button does, but you turn it on and it works. Um, now I don't do that. And the reason is I learned that when I turned the button on because it worked, it did something else that I didn't know about, right? Because Blender, we're doing this magic act, right? We're just, we're, we're feeding these little buttons on this thing and this big machine in the background is doing all this work. And when you turn on a button, if you don't know what it's connected to and how it's interacting with something else, you can break something and you wouldn't know what it's happening. And then later on, you'll encounter the problem and then you'll have to come up with this whole other workflow on how to fix it. So I think actually what showed that to me or the reason my perspective changed was um, when I did that tutorial on the secrets of photorealism, where I talked about the filmic color space um, that uh, Troy Sobotka put into Blender and is now default. And I never realized before how important it is to learn something like color space and as boring and as technical as that sounds, why that is important is because if you're using the old sRGB transfer, or, or sorry, um, what is it? It's linear color space versus relative, I can't remember. Color, color space is the most technical. In fact, I actually wanna interview um, uh, Charles Poynton, I think for my podcast, he's like the color expert, just so that I can ask him all the questions I have around color. Um, but if you if you use the old fashioned way and the previous way that I was making scenes using the sRGB, which was default and blend, that's the way everyone did it. You had, uh, if you wanted sunlight into the scene, you would have to reduce the intensity of the sunlight because it was clipping on everything because it looks so bright. But it, it should have been bright because the sun is bright, but I had to reduce it so that. And then because of that, there wasn't enough bounce lighting coming off the chair into the rest of the scene. So then what do you have to do? You have to add in lamps, an area lamp off the chair, an area lamp off here to try to like add in that reflection. So you could end up, if you just use the right setting, if you learned about filmic and then you use that space, you could, just turn on the sun lamp at the exact exposure range that it needs, the right intensity, and everything else works for you. So that's why I, I love to learn the nitty gritty of like, how does this thing work? So that when um, so that when I'm using it, I mean, for one, it like when I make a tutorial, I don't want people to like call me out and go like, you're so wrong about this. I wanna make sure it's accurate, but also it when you learn all that stuff, it's such a superpower because you can end up with work that just, it just feels right. It doesn't feel like you're fighting a setting. It doesn't feel like forced. It doesn't feel muddy like a lot of other works, like a lot of like my beginner stuff. It was all, I could tell I didn't really know what I was doing. I was just like forcing it in there, like wrestling with it. But when you take the time to learn exactly what it is you're doing, you can end up with something that, uh, not surprisingly, it just works because it's, it's replicating the real world. Um, anyways, long answer. Somebody asked, am I in Korea? Nope, used to be, used to be. Um, lived there for three years, now I'm back in Australia. Yep, brought my uh, now wife back to Australia. Now we live here, got two kids. And we're not planning to go to live in Korea. I mean, we visit like every year, but we're not planning to live there because of schooling. <laughs> Ask any Korean person why they don't wanna have kids in Korea because school is terrible. It's like the most exhausting thing and high suicide rates, just to put too much pressure on them. It's like, no, we can't do that for our kids. Gotta be born outside of Korea. All right, any thoughts about the metaverse? Ooh, juicy, juicy. So there's a book that just came out by Matthew Ball called The Metaverse, I believe. Um, and it's actually funny, cause like the first, I'd say first few chapters is asking, what the hell is the metaverse? <laughs> because everybody has a different answer to it. It's the most, for sure, like overhyped thing that like as soon as like Facebook said, we're gonna be a metaverse company, suddenly all these other big, you know, Deloitte has got a page on their website about the metaverse and how we're gonna become king of the metaverse and Deloitte in the metaverse. And like, it's like, what are you gonna do, right? Like, what is the metaverse? Do you actually know? And it basically, it was just a way to add valuation to a company almost. Sorry, not crapping on Deloitte. I don't even know if they have that. I think they're just a big company. Um, but you know what I mean? Like there are certain trends like 10, 15 years ago, maybe just 10 years ago, 
it was like add AI to your company, right? And this was when AI was doing nothing. So like companies were saying, we're an AI company, and then they were getting huge amounts of funding. Metaverse is like that right now. Nobody knows what it is, but everyone says it's gonna be exciting. So Metaverse is that. Um, I think that my opinion of what is the Metaverse, uh, in fact, yes, it was, I think it was only a year ago I tweeted on Twitter, I still don't know what the Metaverse is. <laughs> but my opinion on what the Metaverse really is, is that it is just more digital life. That's basically it. However much we're online now, it's just gonna be more of that. And I think there will be more people interacting in 3D virtual spaces. So currently the number of people who play Minecraft, Fortnite, whatever, it skews young um, and it skews male. Right? Actually, I think actually Fortnite and Minecraft might be some of the most like mixed gender sort of crowds, but certainly like, you know, 20 onwards, it's always sort of skewed male. I think um, actually Matthew Ball puts it at about 10 years out where we'll get to the point where your aunt will be talking about the metaverse and an interaction that she had in the metaverse. That's about 10 years out, which I think is, I mean, to me that feels like short. Like I'm like, really 10 years? You don't know my aunt. I don't think <laughs> she's gonna be in the metaverse. Um, it's, a, it's a super exciting idea and it, I mean, it, it's just sort of like inevitable. I don't really know if putting a name to it necessarily helps for a lot of things because no one really had a word for like more games. You know, like more people playing Fortnite. We just called that like the numbers went up on Fortnite, but it's like, it might get to the point where like your parents are going home and instead of like watching TV, they're in the metaverse for a few hours and then like interacting or t like watching, a, you know, their favorite newscaster, but in a real life thing, or I don't know, I don't know. But it could get to that point because, and the reason I think it could get to that point, the reason there's any sort of uh, maybe truth in, in what people are guessing is that for sure we can tell that apps like TikTok are way more addictive than real life, okay? And the reason it's, 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 it can be addictive is that it can be, you can use, you can get every little analytic about it and you can just like optimize for that thing, optimize for your retention, optimize for time spent on platform. And they've just made it the most addictive thing possible. Games like Call of Duty and all these like super addictive Overwatch, all those games, they've got that, but for really like, just like a fun experience, right? They've optimized out for the most, how can you get compressed the most amount of fun into one session? Well, if VR technology improves, which it is every couple of years, they're coming out with a new headset, technology's getting better, the resolution's done. I mean, you see the, the new PlayStation VR 2 thing, it looks amazing. It's even got um, fovea rendering, huh? That means like where your eye is looking, it's rendering that in the highest resolution, but then everything else is doing a lower resolution. That has been like considered the holy grail of VR. And then once they conquer that, that's when it's gonna take off. So VR2, PlayStation, it's already got it. Apparently, I haven't tried it. I don't know, I'm sure there's limitations, but anyways, um, if they can do that, if they can get to that point that like you can put a headset on, well, now your whole life could be addictive, <laughs> right? Your digital life could be way more addictive than your real life life. And when you get to that point, yeah, I think more people are gonna start using that. Um, so I think that's the part that is inevitable. Crack talk, <laughs> somebody calls it. Yeah, man, that's not a bad term. I'm gonna start using that. I'm making a few rooms based on the TV show, The IT Crowd for college using 3ds max and unreal but have no idea where to start when deciding how big a room is or the objects in it where to start deciding how big a room is um well you could use a tool like fspy to get the correct camera perspective the lens thing and then if you just put the image behind it behind your camera which fspy does by default just watch some fspy tutorials and uh then you get the perspective and then you get you know, the scene behind it. And then you can start modeling stuff so that it lines up with the picture behind it. And that's the way to do it. Where can you find experienced blender coaches to talk to, to help me with my project? That's a good question, man. I don't actually know. I don't know if there are any blender mentorships 
out there, to be honest. I do not offer them. I do not offer them, okay? Someone is pretending to be me in all my YouTube comments, and they're saying, here's my WhatsApp number. And then I just learned this yesterday. Somebody tweeted me saying like, hey, great to talk with you on WhatsApp today. And I was like, hmm? I was not on WhatsApp, so who was this pretending to be me? And it's like a scam. Somebody's going like, hey, yeah, it's me, it's Andrew Price. Oh, I can teach you 3D modeling and this and that. It costs $350, two private mentorship sessions. We'll do it over Zoom. It's like an elaborate thing. Like it's, he had to learn about my channel also. Like he was like referring to meshes and what I can teach you. And I was like, Man, this guy had to learn a little bit to get the get his bearings on it. but. No, that's a scam. As someone suffering from social anxiety disorder, am I effed since you often put such emphasis on social face-to-face -face interactions? No, man. I mean, there's plenty of people who have um, social anxiety issues. Um, plenty of people at the Blender Conference next uh, next couple of weeks, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> if you want to go to a, a place that's not a rockin' party, uh, not a lot of outgoing people, uh, go to a blender conference um but there and then those people have gotten over it so it's not i wouldn't say that your your um future is set you know from birth um by any means i think you can you definitely need to get help though if you're finding it's affecting your life F speak to a therapist um i have a therapist i have ocd it has affected me multiple times in my life um to the point that it has just disrupted being able to work at all and a therapist was what helped me out of it so um if that's the case you just need you just need therapy that's really all it is um a qualified therapy mm, um can be a lifesaver so definitely recommend that i have been just flat out of ideas any suggestions uh go to pinterest man pinterest is a rocking place with ideas um pinterest uh i've actually got a page on pinterest called 3d art prompts is it, that's what it's called? Is it like a social place? <laughs> it's like, do people follow each other on Pinterest? I just use it to like catalog all my like reference stuff. Oh yeah, it's called 3D Scene Prompts. I'll, um, I'll paste this in the chat. There you go. Um, I, I, I call it my 3D Scene Prompts. And it's just like a bunch of like images or scenes that I want to make or that inspire me. So some of those might inspire you and maybe you could pin those and then start adding more pins uh, pinterest is actually really good to find like like type like-minded ideas or whatever similar ideas like you'll click like a sci-fi grungy corridor thing and you click it and then there's like another sci-fi one but it's different it's daylight and you click the daylight one and then you get more daylight ones and then it's like the recommendation algorithm is like really really good so um if you want inspiration recommend pinterest um behance is also quite good it's kind of different it's like more advertise um, type art, kind of like, what do you call it? Like abstract, minimalistic. You get a lot of different art on Behance than you do on ArtStation. So recommend those guys as well. Um, but yeah, no, I, apparently I don't, there's no one recommending any um, Blender mentorships, unfortunately. What happened to your wrist? <laughs> yeah. So I mentioned my computer right? The Camino Grando RM station. So it cost 22 grand. They shipped it from Latvia. And then I had it for six months and I had a problem with it. It just for random reasons, when I was rendering and I had Premiere open or a video playing or something, it would just suddenly blue screen. And they tried to fix it. They were very helpful. Um, those guys, Camino, trying to, trying to fix it. They couldn't fix it. So they had to send me another one. Um, and then I had to package that one up in the same box that it came in. And it came in this big wooden crate because it's like 40 kilos. It is a beast of a machine. Water cooled as well as heavy as. So I'm like, <gasps> drop it into this thing. Had to put the thing on, screw the thing into the box. And then the DHL guy comes to like pick it up. And he's like, oh, it's on a pallet. Uh, you need to, uh, you need the strap. And I'm like, oh, don't you have straps? He's like, no, we don't. I'm like, what the? So I had to like run across the road because he was going to leave. I'm like, run across the road, grab some straps from another packing place, run back over here and then look up YouTube, how to use packing straps and like try and do it. And he was helping. So he was like holding it. And then I was like pulling the straps to make it tight. And then he let go. And my wrist just went <laughs> into the edge of this uh, wooden crate. And it just like chink, took a chunk of my uh, skin off. 
Fun times. <laughs> what type of lifestyle does Polygon afford you? Scraping by, comfortable or lavish? I'd say comfortable. I mean, like my wife doesn't have to work because of Polygon, but I'm not, like there are people at the company who make more than me. Like a couple of people actually. <laughs> so I pay myself dividends from the company, which is a way of paying yourself if you own the company. And um, it's just a wage. It just arrives into my bank account every day, but I could make that go up or I could make it go down. And I just keep it at a relatively okay rate that I'm comfortable with and we can raise two kids on. But basically everything that, that the Polygon makes just gets invested back into the business. So we're 34 people at the moment. We're looking to hire maybe another like four people in the next month. 3D modelers, hmm? Anybody got some 3D modeling skills? We, you might see me put up a, uh, a job ad on uh, the Blunder Pay, on my YouTube channel or my Twitter. So maybe people can apply to that. But yeah, we're looking for modelers, um, junior modelers, I would say. Um, but yeah, we, we'll, we might be hiring them. <laughs> mm, have you read The 4-Hour Workweek? Great book. Yeah, no, I've read it a couple of times. Um, everything by Tim Ferriss is great. Read a couple of his books. Um, very good. He's got great advice on um, like just removing things from your life, like figuring out like what gives you 80% of the results with only 20% of the time, like that kind of thing. So that's that stuff is great. Yep. Can torrenting courses and other things related to 3D ever be ethical to you? I have to be Freddy Freddy due to my situation. No, um, my personal view on it is no, it is wrong to do that, especially given the amount of free content there is online is my opinion, there's no excuse to torrenting something. If somebody has put in the effort to make a course with all the time and they have put it with a set price, that is their price to own that thing. So um, it's not legal. It's not ethical by my, my standards. Um, I don't think you can really lay claim to that. Um, you might be poor. I mean, here's what else you can do. You can email that artist and say like, I only have this much money. Can I pay something and still get access to the course because of this? And they, I've heard a lot of artists say that they, like they will, they will do that. They'll give discounts when people ask for it. Um, at Polygon, actually, we now have discounts depending on the region of the area you are in. Because people in India, for example, generally make a lot less than somebody in America or different, different parts of the world have different, um, living standards. And so therefore there should be different prices depending on the region of the world that you are from. So we just introduced this, for example, you could, if you were from, you know, somewhere else that didn't have a lot of money, if you went you know, message them and said, Hey, I don't have a lot of money. Can I get a discount? They probably would give you a discount, honestly. So I do that before looking at torrenting. Um, torrenting is very tempting, obviously, because it's free and it's the full thing, but I don't think it is right to do, um, given the free stuff that is out there and the other ways that you can, um, you can get it. What are your predictions for the industry in the coming years? I think, here's something else, right? So prediction on the AI, that's one thing. Prediction on the industry, I think that for sure there will be less of certain jobs, right? Like if you were a junior concept artist, perhaps, and your job was like filling in the or rendering the work perhaps of what the, maybe the senior guys were doing. I think that kind of job is at risk, especially if you didn't have skills outside of that. The skills that will change. Um, now, because of that, I don't think it means that the studio is suddenly gonna like fire a bunch, it's just not gonna happen. They're still gonna be there. It's just, they're gonna be hiring different people. And also something else to consider, the number of studios or companies, not just studios, just businesses around the world that are now able to afford art has now gone up, right? So there are now people who were, I mean, maybe, and people that had like a measly budget budget before, um, now they're able to use AI to make that work better. So uh, so they're gonna need someone to like drive that art, right? To direct it, get, get a better result out of it because they're guys, they just don't have the time. So there are going to be more people, more opportunities, I think, for artists in the future to um, to get jobs. It's, it's just going to be different skill sets. That's basically it. Um, there's going to be more, more. Yeah, the cost of like creating things is just crushed. Like if you look like back in the early days, like Jurassic Park, ILM, like it was that was insane what they did at the time. It's like rudimentary by today's standards, and it could only be done by the world's best, best experts. 
and teams of them, teams of them were able to do this thing, right? Now somebody can do it with Blender. One single person can get a similar-ish result to it. I've seen I, a lot of people have remade the Jurassic Park. I think it doesn't look as good. Yeah, there's a lot of skill involved in it, but still, it, it what I'm saying is true. The, the cost of creating it has just drastically fallen. So that means that's why you can see Instagram ad, uh, sorry, Instagram ads for a company you've never heard of that only has like three people and it's got an advert with a 3D animation that 10, 20 years ago would have costed a fortune, right? It's because the cost of things is falling. And as costs keep falling, there's gonna be more and more people who want to enter into it. So those will go up. How can an artist get famous? Get good, scrub. That's all I can say. <laughs> get good. You don't need to worry. Like, yeah, you could, you know, you could make TikToks. You could make advice. You could do anything like that. Like, if you just want to make art and you want to get famous for it, you got to make good art. So just get good. <laughs> There's nothing else to it. Have you ever been involved in any films or shows? No. I mean, no. I mean, I've been offered various jobs, but it's just not something that I want to do because, like, this is just my focus. But... My first, the first job I ever did was for Bridgestone Tires. It was the only paid job that I ever did really in my history of my life. And um, they asked me to, oh, I was doing a smoke simulation because I made a smoke simulation tutorial. They, somebody from the studio watched it and then they went, can you do the smoke for this advert of this tire that goes, whoosh, you know. I was like, great, I'll do it. And then um, this was like back in 2008, I want to say. And then um, it was, I had to mail a DVD with the frames on it. This is how old it was because my internet was so slow because I lived, I live in Australia. Um, I, could, I couldn't get it to them fast enough. So it was in Sydney. So I had to mail it to them. And uh, it was very important that I get it to them by Friday. Super important. So Thursday, put the DVD in the thing, put it in the, the envelope. And, you know, it's got all the information to fill it in, fill in the address, yada, yada, yada. Mail it off. I come home from work that day. I worked at like a laborer. I was a bricky kind of job. Anyway, come back home. It's sitting on my desk. My dad gave me the today's mail and it's sitting on my desk. And I freaked out. And I realized in my nervous panic to get this thing shipped, I had misread on the label thing, the to and the from. And I had put to myself I shipped it express to myself and I put theirs as the from. <laughs> so I had to call him up and be like, I've made a big mistake. And I like explained what I did and, he, and then there's just this long silence and he goes, shit. <laughs> it was terrible. I think actually it, it ended up, I was trying to upload it overnight anyway and I think they got enough of the frames that they could show the client and composite it that it was okay. <laughs> But it was still, uh, it was the worst thing I've ever done. It's terrible. Anyways, good times. Do you still support pro lighting skies? Probably not, to be honest. Like the Polygon add-on is what I would suggest because we've got all the HDRs on Polygon. And if you use the Polygon add-on, you click it and you can just download HDRs and then use it in your scene immediately. And it functions just like ProLighting Skies. So it's got the same skies as ProLighting Skies does, but it's a free add-on and you only pay for the HDRs that you use basically. So I would suggest that. Mm, Open-ended question, I like this one. All right, my final question that I will answer. What are some steps you'd recommend for a self-taught artist to get to a point where you can get a job within a year? Okay, so. Um, it will be hard, but you can do it. You will need to work full time learning yourself. Okay. I would recommend that. That's, I mean, you can't do it and have a job at the same time. Probably you need to be spending, you know, about eight, 10 hours a day learning. You can have weekends off. What to focus on first and foremost, the technical. Okay. So you need to know, you can't do anything until you know how to grip the handles of the controls of the software you're using to get any sort of results from. So you need to know the basics of it. And the way you do that is by following tutorials. So you at the start are gonna be consuming tutorials. And it doesn't really matter in what order or self-taught curriculum, I would say at the start, you just like enough tutorials that you're figuring out and learning things, okay? Then what I suggested before of doing one tutorial, then do one by yourself, one tutorial, one by yourself, okay? Um, I think what is important, um, like once you've got the beginner, you've done the donut, 
thumbs up, done the donut. Um, after that, I would say modeling will be very helpful. Modeling. Um, depends obviously what job you're trying to get as well. So this really, really depends. Let's say you're just trying to get a job as an environment artist. Okay, so modeling first, then you want to obviously try and follow some environment tutorials just to get your bearings. How does scattering things work? How does, how do you use HDRs or like the sky texture in Blender, that kind of stuff. Um, and then you should be learning the, the design theory. Now there's actually a really good free course by Control Paint. Control Paint, it's a website. I think he's got some stuff on YouTube as well, but I think it's mostly on his website. I think it's an older course by now, but it's still great. And it is called, okay, Principles of Design. Um, so it is a series of like seven videos that I just keep recommending everybody watch. It's great, watch that series. Um, it teaches you about scale and proportion, repetition, emphasis, balance, movement, unity. And he's got a bunch on like composition, uh, visual tangents, a lot of stuff there that's actually very, very useful. Um, actually, he's got a number of stuff on here, it's like using reference materials, painting. Yeah, it's very good stuff. Anyways, his advice there will help you in learning how to create a more pleasing frame if you're trying to become an environment artist. Um, yeah, and learning how to compose a shot to make it more interesting. Um, I would also probably look at design. Trouble is I don't really know any good design tutorials because I'm still trying to figure it out myself. But like you can have a house that is a house and then you can have a house that is actually an interesting house because it has interesting shapes. It has uh, balance and variation stuff. Actually, he's probably got some stuff in control paint. Maybe I haven't explored his recent stuff. Um, but that would sort of be my approach. But really, it's it's just a matter of like, Con, like consuming and learning as much as you can and trying to look for the weaknesses, look for the problems and the areas that you can tell are weak. And you can tell areas that are weak sometimes by self-reflecting, sometimes by asking for feedback, um, but sometimes you need to just put space between yourself and that, that subject. So maybe work on another project, then go back to it and go like, ah, oh, that looks weak. And you can tell now because you've had, your eyes have had time to, uh, forget what it was that you were looking at, right? So that would be my suggestion there. If you can afford a mentorship, I'd recommend a mentorship because a mentor will be able to look at what you're doing and point you in the direction of what you need to work on um, without you having trying to figure it out yourself and waste time learning the wrong thing. Um, that's my advice. Hope that helps. And that'll do us, guys. Thank you for listening to this podcast. If you are listening to the podcast, uh, thank you. And if you're not listening to the podcast, subscribe. The Andrew Price Podcast. Type that into your YouTube chat right now. The Andrew Price Podcast. And go subscribe. It's also on Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, wherever it is you get your podcasts from. And um, thank you for listening. 